My name is Kevin Ray Evans. I'm at Missouri State University in the Department of Geography, Geology, and Planning. The title of my talk is Round Rocks and Other Enigmatic Features of Wobble Structures, St. Clair County, Missouri, USA. This talk was designed to be uh, at the Duluth meeting where we were hoping uh, Ryan Clark and I from, uh, from the uh, Iowa Geological Survey had hoped to have a, uh, a core workshop there on impact structures uh, featuring Decora core and maybe some from Manson as well. Uh, that's not happening and so I wanted to give this talk to give you some background on what happened at Wablo Structure Mid-Mississippian Impacts. This, uh, this talk is made possible by the National Science Foundation, U.S. Geological Survey's EDMAP program, the Beringer Family Fund for Meteorite Impact Research, uh, two graduate students' efforts as well. Uh, the MoDOT, uh, Missouri Department of Transportation, has drilled several cores from the structure. Uh, Missouri State University has provided faculty research grants, and Ash Grove Aggregates has actually made it possible for us to uh, uh, visit the uh, Osceola facility several times. Um, the main points of this are that Wablo is an impact structure. It's mid-Mississippian in age. It's a low-angle marine impact. Uh, we have uh, abundant and multiple directions of diagnostic planar deformational features in quartz grains in the uppermost portions of the Wablo breccia. Uh, you can actually see in the left-hand side a small circular feature, and that's eight kilometers across. That's what we call the main impact area. That's our interpretation. And then beyond that, there's a larger uh, sort of feature that's round as well and eccentrically uh, located uh, to the smaller feature, and that is the tectonic rim. And so from that, we have interpreted the trajectory towards the south, from the southwest to the northeast, which during Mississippian time would have been from the west to the east. And so mainly the focus for this talk is to provide you some background on some of the more unusual features. These are both uh, structural in origin and also that includes the uh, chert round rocks from this area. There are some oblique stylolites uh, or LS tectonites that are associated with it also. There are hematite octahedra after magnetite and uh, some aragonitic clusters that resemble shatter cones. And so I have some photographs of those as well. Uh, there are broken folds, and then these folds also have thickened axial sections, and there are thrust faults in the Wablo impact. There are about 200 uh, impacts, terrestrial impacts known on Earth, and then in the United States, a little over 35, and uh, there are three in Missouri. The ones in Missouri are Wablo in the west, Decaturville in the central part of the state, and in the eastern part of the state, there's the Crooked Creek structure. Uh, each of these either has the shatter cones or planar deformational features in quartz grains. In the uh, geologic map here, you can see that there are different levels of erosion associated with each one of these and Wablo being the best. Um, in a digital elevation model across this area, you can see that they're all lined up as well. Now, there is a match line uh, from the top image that goes to the left side of the bottom image. And so that's Wablo, Decaturville, and Crooked Creek. In this close-up image of Wablo, you can actually see the two circular features here again that are eccentrically located relative to one another. It looks something like an eyeball, with um, the larger part being the, uh, the entire eye, and then the pupil and iris in the southwestern part. Uh, it shows you both the D, uh, digital elevation model and the shuttle, the shuttle radar topography model for Wablo here. Here's our interpretation then for the trajectory for this impact, and it would have been a marine impact in middle Mississippi. Um, here's the paleogeographic reconstruction for that time period, uh, modified from um, Scotese and others uh, in the left-hand side, and it shows you where Laurentia was located uh, during uh, mid-Mississippian time. And on the right-hand side from Lane and De Kaiser, you can actually see the paleogeographic reconstruction of the Burlington Shelf here, and so the impact. Um, here's a cartoon version of what we think happened. If it came out of the southwest, hit shallow water, hit the Burlington limestone itself, Burlington Keokuk limestones undivided. Uh, below that, there's a whole series of lower Paleozoic rocks. Uh, and then eventually, of course, this thing exploded and it brought uh, even basement rocks up into within 200 feet of the surface uh, in, in one of the cores that we have. The, uh, the breccia lens itself is at least 300 uh, feet thick. Research breccias uh, were deposited by marine currents into and over the top of most of the breccias. Uh, and then after that, there were 
still some Mississippian uh, carbonates that were deposited. And then eventually during uh, Pennsylvanian time, there were marine shales and then eventually non-marine sandstones were deposited for this area. Slide 10 shows the uh, planar deformational features and a, a select few uh, quartz grains. And these are on the order of the two um, two feet size of uh, quartz grains. And you can see the multiple directions in the photographs, close-ups uh, in the right-hand column. And then there's a distribution of the different uh, orientations of each one of these grains. There were about uh, 77 grains here, I guess, and about 157 different sets of planar deformational features. This work was done by uh, Jared Morrow, uh, the late Jared Morrow of uh, San Diego State University uh, back in 2007. Well, what do the rocks look like here? This is the Osceola facility for Ashgrove Aggregates Quarry. Uh, you can see that it's completely devastated by the, the um, this is, well, this is a mile and a half outside of the main impact area, but directly down trajectory. And so you can see blocks in here. You can see, uh, really, it's just shattered. Uh, refer to this as a uh, fracture breccia because the rocks are just essentially broken in place. But then there are also these mega breccia blocks like in the second image, on the top row here. In the third image, you can see that that uh, fracture breccia is over the top of some folded strata. Uh, those folds pretty tight right in there, and so recumbent folds and uh, thrust fault uh, right about where the uh, person's head is, is there. My head, I guess. Uh, there's another fold here uh, with uh, Jim uh, uh, Donna Meyer in, uh, from Kansas City standing in that image, and you can actually see the nose of the fold pointing to the, uh, to the south there, actually, or to the right. And then the last two photographs show some of the uh, dilution breccia uh, common in the lower aspects of this quarry facility so you don't get a lot of uh, dilation too many of the other settings you can actually see an injection breccia between two large blocks of burlington keokuk limestone on the right hand side you can see uh, a whole uh, massive uh, mega breccia block right there of the northview uh, siltstone uh, wedged in with some of the uh, carbonates of the, of the mississippi as well so this is a model, cartoon model of what we think is going on in the uh, in the quarry itself. There is at the very top uh, what seems to be the bottom of the resurge breccia, the basal part of a resurge breccia. It is a polymic breccia. It has uh, lots of abundant uh, crinoids and so forth. The fracture breccia and mega breccia block terrain is below that, or the that uh, domain is below that. And then after that, uh, you get the uh, the areas that were a little bit more deeply buried. And you have uh, recumbent folds and thrust folds and so forth. Middle section there. And then there's a decolamone that seems to follow, uh, at least in part, along a uh, surface within the, the Northview formation. In slide 14, you can see some of the upper resurge breccia. And uh, that's the, um, some of the first images taken, actually, of the, uh, of the outcrops along Highway 13. And a close-up of uh, a block of that material showing the polymic nature of it. There are uh, calcite uh, vug fillings as well. Uh, green siltstone clasts are within this, and then also large, uh, well, smallish sort of chunks. So I guess the uh, the green siltstone class at the bottom is about two centimeters to give you a scale on that. Uh, for the photograph on the uh, upper left-hand side, these blocks are about eight meters high, so about 25 feet or so high. Uh, in the tallest place, so in the base of the from the base of the ditch, that's about the height place. Uh, we drilled uh, a core right over the top of this, and when we drilled down, it took 30 feet to hit to this uh, breccia, in this upper part of the breccia, but at the very base, we actually hit, in this location, a crystalline basement breccia at the very bottom. And so that is the uh, granites that are clasts uh, with uh, carbonate mixed in in the interstate material here. For some of the, for some of the diagenetic sort of uh, aspects of the uh, Wablo breccia, here are some of the octahedra or spinel uh, structure uh, um, crystals, small crystals of hematite after magnet. These tend to be finely disseminated through the upper part of the breccia, and they uh, are fairly common. So in the acid digestion, uh, in trying to recover conodonts for this to show the age of the impact, uh, these were some of the side results of that, as well as the quartz grain. Another aspect are these unusual sort of features like this. Now, these are sort of lineations that uh, occur in these rocks, and they resemble very much uh, stylolites. And stylolites you can get in tectonic settings as well, along fault zones and things like that. 
Uh, but it appears as though some of these things are actually not surfaces so much as they are penetrative. And so they've actually uh, breached over from there must be some sort of like middle ground between stylolites and things that are LS tectonites. And so LS tectonites have a more penetrative sort of structure. I like to uh, propose that uh, these are resembling sort of um, like a bed of nails, if you will, the, the kind of novelty sort of item that you might see in a in a gift shop where you could press your hand into it and it would then show the image of your hand uh, in nails opposite side. You follow me on that, but uh, that's the sort of feature that these LS Tecton would sort of resemble. In slide 17, you can actually see two separate directions on these sort of features. And uh, some of these may be related to uh, to faulting as well. So this seems to be very near the base of the bedrock, um, actually the top of the bedrock and the base of the unconsolidated sediment, about a mile and a half. Again, so this is all from the quarry in this facility. Uh, so about one and a half miles outside of the rim of the impact area. Now, when we drilled uh, some of the core, you could actually see similar features here, but curved, a little bit curved in some of these. And so uh, in this one, you can actually see uh, that surface exposed in the middle of the core. Moving on from the uh, L-tectonites and the stylolites, here are some of these uh, fibrous or uh, acicular sort of crystals that you would get perhaps with uh, aragonite. So this is probably calcite after aragonite right here. So larger crystals on the right-hand side and some of the smaller ones on the left-hand side. So that entire image uh, field of view right there is about 1.5 centimeters on the left-hand side and about 4 centimeters across on the right-hand side. But these are sort of things that resemble shatter cones but aren't shatter. And so uh, we have yet to find a, a true shatter in some of these rocks. Now these are rocks that tend to be fairly... Uh, crystalline in, in nature, but crystalline in the sense that they are uh, made out of mostly crinoid columnal and that sort of material. If we were to go to the northwestern side of the impact structure, you could actually see some of the cliffs of the Osage. Now, this is the type area for the Osage series. And uh, here you see a, a cliff that's relatively undisturbed on the left-hand side. But if you're to follow that around in one of the river bends here, you can actually see uh, thrust fault over the top of folded straight air, tightly folded in a fold just above the kayak and side. In this image, you can see Brandon Zaitz, who traveled with me on this day to uh, to investigate these sort of features. He's standing next to one of these folds where it's been folded back on itself. And we call this one the shepherd's crook. So we have uh, different identifiers for each one of these. But there would have been a breccia uh, in the areas that are behind this and maybe siltstone class that have been weathered out of some of that injection breath to the right-hand side of this image. This is another one of these uh, broken folds in this case. And so you see the isoclinal fold with a thickened uh, se uh, section in the middle of this thing along the angle plane there. And uh, this one we call knuckles. And you can see a thrust fold uh, at the base of that same layer off to the right-hand side of this image. This is a feature we call the bookends. And uh, this is where some of the beds are more or less vertical on the right-hand side. And it's just more or less a melange in the middle part. Uh, for the, the next slide, you can actually see a thrust fault in the upper part of the cliff face here. And so this is quite unusual in places like uh, central Missouri, where you get essentially flat-lying strata that are deposited in a platformal sort of setting. And this feature right here is uh, essentially a, an injection breccia that, that is in between two flat-lying uh, layers. Uh, in the Sedalia Formation, and then above, probably in the uh, Pearson, and uh, we're missing the North View form. You can see the breccia on the right hand. So the round rocks are quite unusual at this uh, this location as well. So you can see one inside you on the left hand side, and one that's been weathered out on the right hand side, and rolled partially along a quarry wall, a uh, quarry floor there. Uh, they tend to have a siltstone clast or a chert clast in their centers in the cortex, and uh, Here's one that has a chert center in it here, but it's unusual in that it has sort of a, a filling that um, silicate filling, if you will, replacing what would have been uh, some sort of fluid that was in there. And there's actually an internal sediment at the bottom of this one on the upper one cutaway and then also the right hand side. The one at the bottom is more typical where you don't see a core necessarily. Maybe the saw cut missed the core in this one, but you actually see some discoloration, some hematite staining in the center. So these things are actually done and not uh, ballistically emplaced and not accretionary. 
Here's an unusual one here that was broken and then it looks as though some soils have gotten in there. And so you see these round sort of pelletized uh, particles that accumulate in the center of one of these uh, the hollowed out uh, uh, versions of the round rocks. And on the right hand side, you can see one that's also diagenetically altered uh, late stage of diagenesis. For these sorts of features, they also sometimes get incorporated into the Pennsylvania sandstones. It gives a precise age then, of course, for the impact. Uh, it has to be pre-Pennsylvanian if you see a clast in it. And so on the left-hand side, you can see how these things also have become something of an, a cultural icon in the uh, Osceola area here. So this is Roadside Park, a little bit south of Osceola. So that's uh, the extent of my talk, just to give you some of the also rands uh, with the Wablo impact. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you.